presenter today is Dr. Naomi Beingessner, and the topic is Social and Economic Impacts of Changing Land Use and Land Tenure. Companies and individuals are increasingly seeking to buy land in Scotland to benefit from its offsetting potential, while farmers and landowners are being asked to increase the positive impact of land use. The Scottish government was concerned with the social and economic impacts on rural people and changes in land use tenure, so it commissioned research to measure current trends and guide policy on land reform, net zero, and other environmental goals, natural capital governance, and community engagement and decision making. Naomi Beingessner's presentation will provide examples of both small and large social large scale change from Scotland and other global North countries and assess the perceived and actual inputs, both benefits and challenges on rural communities and businesses and land managers, offering considerations for land use transitions and highlighting concerns regarding equity and social justice outcomes. Naomi Beingessner was born and raised in Southern Saskatchewan, Treaty 4 territory, and she completed an MA on alternative land tenure in Saskatchewan at the University of Regina in 2013. Uh, and then she was, oh, and, um, and she did a PhD on changing relations in agriculture land tenure and access in the Canadian prairies at the University of Manitoba in 2022. She currently works as a social researcher at the James Hutton Institute in Scotland, where her work focuses on social and socioeconomic impacts of land use and ownership change on rural peoples. So far, this has included research on land reforms, uh, land reform future, futures, land use and just a uh, just tradition, transition, green land investment and community land rights. Her work often provides information and evidence for the Scottish government policy on land related issues. So Naomi, Please go ahead with your presentation. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say. All right, let's see if I can get this to work here. And can you see my screen okay? I haven't seen anyone jumping up and down and saying no. So um, it's great to be here. It's really nice to see a lot of names I recognize. Um, it's almost nicer to see names I don't recognize because that, to me, says that the NFU is growing, and that's kind of exciting. So I can't claim after a year and a half here in Scotland to be an expert on anything Scottish, but I have had a chance to develop some specific knowledge on land use and land tenure, and um, I'll try to provide some context and hope that some points of comparison with Canada can be made. Uh, let me just see if I can change my slide. There we are. I wanted to start just telling you about where I work. I've been working for the past year and a half. It's the James Hutton Institute, and the entire purpose of its research is land. So we have six, who's that? Six, five science departments. And you can see a lot of them are the physical science, um, soil and plant breeding, that sort of thing. I belong to the bottom department, social, economic, and geographical sciences. And um, we do a lot of quantitative and qualitative research methods. We focus on uh, problems relevant to environmental and rural issues in Scotland and in Europe through partnerships and uh, beyond as well. We research um, things such as the social and economic dimensions of rural development, local food, agriculture and wider food systems, land management and transitions, natural resource use, human environment relationships, governance and institutions, communities and health. Um, and we are committed to engagement and dialogue outside of academia. So we often co-create research projects with stakeholders who range from policymakers to community groups. Um, Kathy said, I do produce work to inform policy, but I cannot guarantee that any of it actually has an impact after policymakers uh, look at. Hopefully we'll see that in, in the long term. Um, the picture you see there are a few of my colleagues. Some of them are very into creative methods and are sorting Lego uh, for use um, in landscape modeling and, and other things like that. 
so the outline today of what I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give the Scottish context so you have um, an idea of what kind of changes are taking place, what the status quo is. I'm going to do two sections. One is on land use change, the impacts and some case studies. And one is on land tenure change, some case studies and impacts. Um, if we have time, I'll talk about Greenland investment, which is a recent project we did looking at um, investment for things like carbon credits, and um, then I'll look at the policy and other recommendations that we've kind of made on this topic to government, but also to landowners and uh, communities. So this is a snapshot of rural land related headlines that have uh, appeared since I arrived in Scotland. I've been kind of watching the news and some of the splashier trends get more news coverage. So you can see investment firms and wealthy individuals buying up land for renewable energy, for carbon credits. Um, and then there's pressure on farmers um, from people with expectations that um, agriculture should improve the environment. And if it doesn't, you know, what do we do about that? So the green layered gold rush um, is, is a really common narrative. Um, you can see some green layers up top. They're from the uh, brewing company BrewDog and they are planting trees to offset their, their carbon. Um, crofters and farmers in the Cairngorms Park are protesting against the reintroduction of beaver, which had been extinct from the UK. And people are worried about solar farms taking up farmland. Um, so, the broader Scottish context, we do see a lot of trends that are common across the global north, and I know that um, many, if not all of these, are present in Canada as well. So rising land prices, definitely a trend, increasing land concentration in fewer hands, a difficulty for new entrants and smaller farmers to access land, the population of rural communities shrinking, those are all socioeconomic trends. Um, the environmental trends specific to Scotland and some of them elsewhere. Declining biodiversity is huge. It's a huge concern. Um, the degradation of peatland is a huge concern for the climate as it naturally is a carbon sink, but is an emitter when degraded. Uh, monocultural land uses are a concern for um, various environmental reasons. Vulnerability to climate change. We've had two recent storms here in the last week. Um, so that's an issue. And of course, high emissions from land use as well. So to address some of these, the Scottish government is committed to becoming a net zero society by 2045. And that does involve rural land use as well as of course, a lot of other industries and places. Um, they've also uh, decided to bridge the nature finance gap. But what they mean by that is how much is being um, invested into environmental solutions now and how much do we need to invest to uh, accomplish everything we hope to do. They say there's a 20 billion pound gap. Uh, it's about 35 billion Canadian dollars. And they think that private investment needs to step in and fill that gap because public investment is not going to. At the same time, uh, you may have heard of Brexit some time ago, we're still feeling its effects and Scottish agriculture subsidies are being restructured um, away from the uh, common agricultural program of the European Union, which we no longer belong to, and they're being restructured to focus more on environmental outcomes. Uh, not everything happening is negative in rural Scotland. There's a lovely picture here of the Isle of Egg, which is owned by the community. So land reform is uh, one, one thing that actually drew me to Scotland and research here. Um, the redistribution of rights to land to meet social, economic, environmental, and political demands and rebalancing rights and responsibilities in land ownership. So Scotland has been very, uh, the government has been behind land reform since um, an act in 2003, obviously prior to bring the act into existence. And the agenda is to seek greater diversity in landowner types, diversity of scale in land holdings, and in land tenure availability. Primarily, they've done this through granting access rights. So the right to roam, you may have heard of, we have that here. Um, they are working on community empowerment and they are supporting both financially and through other resources, community land ownership. So, however, my job is uh, to help address problems. So we're going to talk about those. The first question is change from what? 
Uh, this is the picture of the status quo in Scotland. This map is from a project that is working on land use transformations for net zero. I'm peripherally involved. So this shows the major uses of Scotland's land. 80% of it is agricultural, and that's about 6.2 million hectares. Most of it is no. extensively used. So over half of that land is rough grazing, which means there's a very low stocking rate. It's not suitable for arable uh, farming. But over 5 million of those 6 million hectares are on what they call less favored agricultural land. And so only about 500,000 hectares are used for arable farming. There's a lot of grassland as well. And if you look at the color chart there, it gives you an idea. Um, the purples are heather, moorland, um, which is, is some grazing. Um, a lot of it is former or current shooting estates where people go out and shoot grouse or deer or what have you. Um, the brown is bogs and the gray, I uh, don't think you can see. Can you see my cursor? I have no idea, but the gray is stone. Um, what you have left there is trees, kind of the darker green. You can see towards the south of Scotland, there's a lot of actually forestry plantations. And the orange is either arable grassland or um, cropland and horticulture. And this, uh, this land use really needs to change significantly, significantly given the level of emissions and carbon sequestration that's going on right now. A big part of the impetus around land reform is the current status quo of land tenure, the concentration of private ownership. Scotland is vying with Brazil for the most concentrated private land ownership uh, in the world. So 50% of private rural land in Scotland uh, is owned by only 432 owners. That's your bottom graphic there. And just 16 owners are responsible for 10% of private land. Private land itself is 83% of Scotland's land. 2.2% um, is owned by communities, 12% owned by the government, and 2.5% by uh, various other third sector organizations, charities, conservation organizations, that sort of thing. So this concentration of land ownership is due to historical power relations and persistent hierarchies. But there are indicators of increasing concentration um, due to the natural capital market, and that has introduced new landowners, such as investment companies, and um, increased that concentration of ownership. Other issues that make it worse are an unregulated land market. There's no restrictions on foreign ownership, for example. There's a lack of transparency. The Scottish Land Registry only has about, I'm going to get the number wrong, but it's definitely less than 70% of land ownership is registered. And there's a lack of accountability by private landowners. So the Scottish Land Commission has warned that there are some benefits in economies of scale. And you'll find that very large landowners say that they are the most efficient way to bring about positive environmental change. But there are significant risks of concentrated power and evidence that this is having adverse impacts in some places. So the government is still very much behind the land reform agenda. These are some of the projects I've worked on or am working on. And on the left, the rural land use transformations is the one that led to the land use map I showed you earlier. And there are three reports on the right that I believe Jill is going to uh, provide links for in the chat. And much of this presentation is based on the top right report, which is a literature review of the social and economic impacts of land use change. So we were asked to do that report by a Scottish government policy team uh, who wanted to know more about integrated land use. So they asked us to look at situations of formerly conventionally farmed agricultural land and um, look at changes that uh, were made to it. This was a literature review. We didn't go out on the land and see anything for ourselves, um, but that did mean that we got to look at uh, any country in the global north. So we did find, um, we found a lot of examples. What we didn't find, unfortunately, was a lot of empirical data. Not a lot of researchers went out there, collected data. Uh, there was a lot of modeling, computer modeling, um, and there was very little long-term data. So 
there might be effects of short-term effects of change, but they didn't go back 10 years later and find out the long-term effects. Despite that, we were able to look at land use changes such as agroecology, agroforestry, nature restoration, renewable energy, afforestation or reforestation, biofuels, and land abandonment. And um, the idea was to, to provide some guidance for, for solutions to sustainability challenges, such as climate change, the biodiversity decline, but also food security and poverty alleviation. Overall, um, after we took the, undertook the literature review of international literature, um, English literature in the global north, we found that land use change might have a relatively small footprint. So for example, in the picture, um, you see two wind turbines. Uh, this isn't a, a open strip mine or something like that. Um, but despite the small footprint, the maybe several meters of land they take up, they may have significant impacts. One thing that is uh, a big concern in Scotland and some communities is the aesthetic impacts of renewable energy um, on the landscape, on the scenery. Um, Scotland has a lot of tourism. And so uh, that's one of the reasons that some people are really worried about the aesthetic impact of wind farms. Um, impacts may be distributed spatially and socially unevenly. So they affect different demographics or areas in different ways. Um, the impacts may be direct or indirect, and they may be cumulative as well as having different time scales. So afforestation, for example, has short-term impacts such as an increase in a certain type of job with tree planting or with felling. And then it has long-term impacts as well if land has changed from, for example, farming to um, afforestation and the jobs might go away until the trees mature. So land use change impacts may influence the social acceptability, the legitimacy or social license of different land management approaches and land uses for different stakeholders. And one key point is that the actual and perceived social impacts depend on an individual's awareness and their beliefs about the causes of social change. So people act on their beliefs and perceptions, whether or not they are accurate, and that influences the actual changes that are made. So it really highlights the necessity of understanding the perceived change and the actual change, if possible, if possible. Uh, and I will return to that. So the following slides have some examples of land use change that may be more relevant to Canada. I left out some examples from our report, uh, such as land abandonment. Um, so agroforestry, uh, defined it there, the deliberate integration of woody vegetation on land with pasture. It can include alley cropping, um, integrating hardwood species with agricultural crops, or integrated riparian systems, windbreaks, and forest farming. Um, forest grazing is starting to be a, a thing on a certain segment of Scottish agricultural Twitter, I've noticed. Agroforestry um, has long been identified as an approach to sustainable land use and management that can produce biomass for biofuels and energy, as well as enhance the ability of agriculture to sequester and store carbon. There are some forestry organizations in Scotland who are really, really trying to promote ag agroforestry. I don't think I really need to explain intercropping to anybody, but the simultaneous cultivation of at least two crop species, the aim of uh, complementarity spatially or temporally. So the examples in the literature um, show that often agroforestry and or intercropping can be a route to revitalize rural communities through enhancing agricultural production and key, reducing cultivation costs. And a shift from monocropping to intercropping or multiple crops uh, was considered to increase nutrition, climate awareness, social development, economic diversification, and increase resilience. And in some places, the benefits included reducing rural outmigration and uh, interestingly, encouraging the establishment of cooperatives. Um, agroforestry, it was found specifically, may encourage greater awareness and value placed on local knowledge and indigenous knowledge, as well as increased landowner stewardship. Um, however, the social and economic impacts did rely on the presence of markets. I suspect that is why cooperatives were encouraged and they uh, need support of financial models and also knowledge held by rural communities of, of good agricultural practices. 
agroecology, I know this is something NFU farmers uh, know quite a lot about. There's been uh, several presentations I can remember in the last few years. So here defined as a holistic and integrated approach that applies ecological and social concepts and principles to the design and management of sustainable agriculture and food systems. Um, and it meets the needs of people and nature. Um, the FAO, of course, doesn't really notice or note the political aspect of agroecology, and I, I won't deal with that here, but I think you folks know about that. Pasture-fed livestock systems is one example in the UK that um, has had a fair bit of research on it. And by pasture-led, they mean uh, livestock that are foraging with no supplemental feeding and no indoor shelter, which I think some people in Canada probably would not be wise to choose as far as the weather conditions in Canada versus the UK. So farmers in the UK who transition to agroecological approaches, there's a, there's a decent amount of research. They report decreasing reliance on costly inputs, enhanced production resilience, improved access to payments for ecosystem services. Um, there's a lot of personal benefits to the farmer. So improved well-being, job satisfaction, reduced workloads, um, satisfaction in observing positive environmental improvements, strengthening local supply chains, and a lot of learning and innovation through peer-to-peer -peer engagement that goes along with agroecological methods. Beyond farm level impacts, it creates diverse and meaningful jobs for new people on farms, provides little nutritious local food, and uh, supports a greater connection between people and nature. I have a feeling I'm going to run over time. So I could say something more about the outcomes of pasture-led livestock systems specifically, but if you really want that, you might have to ask me in the questions. So challenges facing farmers in the UK in achieving agricultural, agroecological transitions, sorry, there's a lack of advisory support for new entrants. I would say it's better for organic agriculture here, but that too, of course, is still not as great as support for conventional farming entrants. The potential for high rent prices in Scotland requires tenant farmers sometimes to seek maximum economic returns, and that might mean not agroecological agro production. And there's also the challenge of changing farming mindsets. So the idea that higher yields are equal to more profits um, is challenged by the idea that if your costs are lower, it doesn't matter if your yields are a bit lower as well. Agroforestry and intercropping as well uh, have challenges. There's a high cost and a long time horizon of establishing agroforestry. And there's also cultural resistance to the idea of um, doing these kind of more more complicated, differently complicated things. We looked at a few other countries and Australia was an interesting case because they had a long-term study on the impact of multiple land use changes. And as I mentioned, there aren't a lot of long-term studies. So the context in Australia was an increasing use of land for dairy farming and for arable crops, and also for blue gum plantations. And that's a tree commonly grown for pulp as well rural residential developments. And so the long-term study looked at forestry on farms and on farms, particularly, if the farmer decided to do forestry, uh, integrating it perhaps with the other um, industry on the farm, there was no reported impacts on population numbers. This was a way of making a living, um, doing multiple things. Now, land leased for forestry, on the other hand, led to population reduction. And if land was sold for afforestation, it contributed to changing populations. So a destabilization, not necessarily a decrease or increase. The best case projects were where the projects considered the impact of the population change, whether it be decline or in migration. And they considered the impact on social and physical infrastructure. Um, I heard in one part of Scotland, a lot of complaints about big forestry trucks effects on the roads, for example. Um, the specific Scottish concerns I heard about afforestation, the big one was that it was displacing farmers and tenants. Landowners were turning their land to forestry and, and kicking off tenants in some cases, um, or buying out farmers because the land was more valuable as uh, Sitka spruce. But people also had concerns about the lack of biodiversity in these kind of plantations, uh, increase in road traffic, changing landscape access, and also aesthetics. 
In Germany, the land use change we looked at was a rapid growth in biofuels beginning in about 2003 to four. It expanded for a decade. There were tax incentives, and there was also a quota for a certain percentage of biofuels in the fuel mix. By 2017, energy crops were on 14% of arable land in Germany, and that doesn't include woody biomass. So the benefits were largely region specific. If you were in a region where there was a market and where the uh, soil and climate was suitable, um, increases in income and employment resulted. Uh, but negative impacts included loss of agricultural jobs, increasing land prices, and again, detriment to landscape aesthetics. Uh, there was a possible conflict with food production and impact on food prices. It is unclear from the data and the literature if this was actually happening, but it's certain that politicians talked about it as though it was happening. So the German government in the last couple of years implemented a goal of phasing out first generation biofuels by 2030. So not using the feedstock, but using more waste. We found um, a really nice example of a best case of biogas production. Actually, it was in France. Um, and they recycled locally sourced waste for biogas and produced electricity. It increased farm income and it contributed to a circular economy. Japan's case was agrivoltaics and they really are a leader in that field. After the Fukushima disaster, Japan had a goal of decentralizing energy through agrivoltaics for reasons of energy security, but also to address rural decline and abandoned land, which there was quite a lot of so by 2021, there were more than 2,000 small-scale agrivoltaic systems, and 89% of those were on under 0.3 hectares in area. So very small systems on fairly small farms. These were all owned by farmers. They weren't leasing out land for it. So what it meant for benefits is additional revenue, electricity savings for farm operations, um, you can graze under these ones that you see in the picture, or there are some row crops, matcha tea was one that actually had better growing conditions and a bit of shade. And the communities and the people living around saw them way more positively than they saw solar farms. They wanted the two to be able to coexist, and they didn't want farmland just covered in solar panels. Now, the negative impacts, um, that's not to say everybody liked them in the neighborhood, and there was a potential to drive land prices up. The Japanese government saw that potential and they regulated the type of land that can be used for agrivoltaics in order to avoid hiking up land prices or using really valuable um, productive farmland for agrivoltaics. So in the best case, these provided local benefits and that was when the small scale systems were integrated with the landscapes when they fit in. So, Regardless of the change, there was a wide range of social and economic impacts, but even if the situations and the specific changes weren't the same or weren't what you yourself are facing, there were some general lessons to draw. So the key themes we saw was that the impacts of land use change may be unequally distributed. So they could be exacerbating existing inequalities, they could be socially exclusive, and this really highlighted the importance of maintaining social license and social acceptability of land uses through consultation and participatory approaches. I'm going to just have a sip of water. So land tenure changes is the second topic here. And land tenure is a broader concept than just land ownership because it also includes various aspects of control over and use of land. And so a necessary element of land tenure is the support and that it gets that justifies the relationships of owner and control. So if you have private land ownership, uh, it is supported by the legal system, the government, education, but also cultural values and what people think should be done with land, what approved land uses are. So I did a report on alternative land tenure models and in it, I created a typology of five alternatives to private ownership of land. You can see those down there on the left, indicated by the sheep. And um, I gave, uh, I had about, I think, nine or 10 case studies that I went into details on. I'm going to have to ask Kathy for the time at some point, so I know if I have time to show you some of them, but some of them I think you might be familiar with. 
for community ownership, of course, Scotland had a, a good example. The Glengarry Community Woodlands are owned by a community group that raised money in the form of community shares. Uh, cooperatives you're familiar with in Canada. Unusually, Scotland has no land owning cooperatives. Um, and I haven't talked to anyone yet who's able to explain why exactly, but they're quite big in Germany as well. Um, a land trust, which is a private non-for-profit organization, I believe and a few members had the chance to hear about the Agrarian Trust a couple of years ago, and I know that video is online because I watched it again recently. Terre de Lyon in France also has a land trust as an aspect of what it does, as well as a foundation. Um, foundations are popular in the Netherlands. Uh, they're a charitable trust, but they're memberless. They do have a board, but they don't have members like a cooperative or a land trust might. And finally, municipal ownership, whether that be by a city or a county. There are some interesting examples in Italy and Spain of uses made of abandoned land. There's an agroecology agro network in Spain using abandoned land. And in Italy, there's a really interesting initiative you see there, Sala de la Terra, that provides land to marginalized populations and trains them in farming and in, um, I guess, derivative um, production after that. So, um, Kathy, will you break in and just tell me how much time I have, and then I'll know how much detail I can go sure. into. Sure. You've got uh, 17 and a half minutes. Ooh, maybe I can. Um, you can look at the report if you want to see more, um, but I'll just let you know what, what you will be seeing. If you look, so um, I characterize them by the type of ownership. They ranged in establishment from about 1978 to 2020, and the number of people they involved ranged wildly as well. Um, so you see totally on, on the left, it was the largest land owner with 8,000 hectares, 18,500 shareholders. Um, so it was, it was very interesting for that point. And I know Annette Demaray may still be on this call and she's gonna do quite a lot of research that I'm sure she'll report back on, on this initiative in particular. For each initiative, I looked at their visions. Some of them had more of an environmental vision. Some had a vision specific to agriculture. Some had a more generalized social mission. And of course, you know, many had a combination of those. The operation and governance, I tried to get as many details as I could about how they operated, how they obtained land, um, what kind of uses they made of it, um, the stipulations around use. And then I looked at the challenges and the benefits. And I'm going to talk a little more generally about those last things there too. So I mentioned Sal de la Terra before. Um, Heronborn in the Netherlands was interesting because it was a, almost a crowdsourced model whereby if a region around a city had 200 families sign up to buy land collectively, the organization Heronborn would pay for a farmer who produced for those 200 households. Um, anyway, that was interesting. You could read more about it. Um, Culture Land I put in, it was a cooperative, um, a fairly, a fairly typical cooperative. So it's nice to kind of see what a typical cooperative operates like. And again, they aimed them themselves at uh, organic farmers seeking land. So overall, there were three categories of benefit that these models had that I looked at. And the first was the community benefit. And like I said, some focused on community benefits, others had community benefits that were maybe not their main point, but were more incidental. So this included social cohesion, they had a lot of participation, whether it be volunteers or shareholders or um, employees. They made a contribution to the local food chain. They encouraged local involvement and participation in governance. There was employment provision. Um, in some places, repopulation was supported. And the participatory decision-making um, democratized the, the model quite a bit. The environmental benefits that I looked at were not entirely supported by data. And I'm not saying they don't exist. I'm saying, sadly, no one went out there and did a lot of studies. I did find a lot of master's theses that looked at how these things operated um, from a social science perspective, but not a lot of people went out there and said, oh, hey, is the, is the soil improved or whatnot? But anecdotally and testimonially speaking, if that's a word, um, these models increased biodiversity, 
They supported sustainable farming of various definitions, whether that be organic or whether that be um, biodynamic or you know, more than that um, or less than that. They protected water, they improved soil, and they reclaimed land. And that one actually is probably the easiest one to show. Um, a lot of these also involved certifying or monitoring organizations. So if they were organic, um, their farmers were registered and uh, monitored through an organization. All of the models diversified ownership, which is, of course, the Scottish government's primary goal, beyond the typical public and individual private ownership. So some provided use rights to a diverse set of users. Maybe they were trying to benefit migrants or black or indigenous or people of color or disabled people. And that was a form of land tenure diversity rather than land ownership diversity. The successful ones had these things in common. There was a shared vision and it was rooted in community. Nobody came in and said, oh, hey, you know, this region could really use a cooperative. Um, let's, let's get a group of people together from all over the country and uh, install a cooperative here. So it was, it, they were grassroots, but at the same time, they often worked on multiple scales and the more successful ones definitely did this. So they might be a small cooperative or land trust, but they reached out to different levels of government for support, or they reached out to different types of community, be it a local geographical community or a community of interest. Terre du Lien is an example of an organization that works quite locally in obtaining land and supporting farmers, works nationally for advocacy, and works internationally with the Via Campesina. So government policy and support was not great, but there were aspects of government policy and support that the models either worked really hard to shape themselves to, to take advantage of, or in the case of the really influential ones, were able to influence so they could take advantage of it. And partnerships, alliances, and networks were definitely key. There were limitations, of course, and the first is the small amount of land affected. So these arose in many cases because of the high price and the lack of land that was put on the market. And of course that affected the amount they were able to obtain. So for example, in Germany in 2021, there were 16, almost 17 million hectares of farmland. 2,900 of those hectares belong to the three largest land cooperatives. So just to put it another way, that's 0.00018% of the total farmland in Germany. Almost all the models are based on ideological investment. So impact investors or charitable donations or a solidarity economy, which does mean the motivated, uh, the donors and the participants are motivated, but it does potentially limit the number of contributors. And so therefore it limits impact and expansion if that's what the model is aiming for. It also means that the decision-making is less quick and easy when you're involving a lot of participants and community members and you want it to be democratic. I don't know if that's a negative or not, but it can be seen that way. Um, so there was room for a lot more government level support, policy, funding, and other facilitation. And I think probably some of those soft factors that are hard to measure that enable success. Um, such as human capital. I think we all know something that is dependent on the work of one hardworking person, which does make it vulnerable. So I got the German statistic from these authors, Kumnig and Mosul, and they said the alarming rate of land concentration and loss of the small and medium sized farms will not be solved through land purchases alone, not least because of limitations of scale. I'm going to skip this green land investment. It is honestly the project I'm most proud of but um, probably the least relevant. I don't think purchasing land for carbon credits or future biodiversity credits is huge in Canada, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I have a report that you can consult if you like. And if you're really curious and have time in the chat, you can ask me questions. I want to get to the last thing, which is what kind of tools or activities are used to steer change in the direction that Scotland wants to go towards a more environmentally sustainable and yet still um, productive of food system. So there is a number of um, bills and uh, whatnot that are, are coming up and have just been passed. So the interim principles for responsible investment in natural capital, unfortunately, just guidelines, but um, hopefully encouraging 
investors and landowners to consider the social and the economic and the cultural rights of communities um, when they are doing their investments. There is new legislation coming this spring for land reform in a net zero nation and a new agriculture bill, which will have more incentives for environmental actions. Um, in the land reform bill, they're looking for increasing compliance by private landowners. For example, the need to publish a large scale management plan. Um, they've also proposed a public interest test for land purchases of a certain size. And the size is debated, um, but it is likely to turn out to be anything over 500 hectares needs to have a public interest test. Now, unfortunately, public interest test is not defined, but there are suggestions that since Scotland, the UK is a signatory to the um, economic, cultural and social human rights, I'm getting that in the wrong order, uh, of the United Nations, then that would that would be um, in, that would inform what the public interest test is. And with the focus on community, they would have to show that this land ownership change and the land ownership plans were going to be beneficial for the community. As well, there is uh, the idea floated on restrictions on ownership by entities outside the EU, which would still not have an effect on the largest landowner in Scotland, who is Danish and owns over two hundred thousand acres. But there you are. Um, and then the incentives include things like grants for afforestation and peatland restoration as well. We came to a number of conclusions in our work about land use change. So overall, multifunctionality requires policy and subsidy support. So it needs support and uh, access to markets and value chains for products. So marketing specifically agroecological produce, for example, um, requires knowledge networks and peer support for innovation uptake. Financial models should take account of the long-term nature and returns of alternative land management approaches like agroforestry. Um, there's a lot of planning that goes on in Scotland. I don't know if there is in Canada. This is not something I ever looked into. But nonetheless, you can't avoid it in Scotland. There's an amazing amount of planning. I, I would venture that there's more than there is in Canada. And it needs to be strategic, we're arguing to avoid high quality farmland from being used for solar energy or being used for tree planting. That is definitely a complaint I've heard the National Farmers Union of Scotland raise that um, really good agricultural land is being turned over to trees. So there's that balance of policy priorities regarding net zero and food production. The most effective land use changes, the most win-win that satisfied everybody were introduced at a small scale. And so we recommend that, providing input to local economies, benefit sharing with communities in order to build and maintain community trust and landscape integration. Community-based impact assessments can help avoid the negative impacts of land use change and enhance the positive impacts. Um, we need to look at the impact on different groups. So farmer versus rural resident, um, farm worker versus farmer, tenant versus owner, and the inequalities that might arise through land, change, uh, land use change for climate change mitigation. Um, so the just transition in agriculture, the Scottish government is coming out with a plan in this spring and um, has been doing quite a bit of consultation. So I look forward to seeing that because the just transition planning thus far has really been focused on energy and now they're taking on other sectors. So the other recommendation we had is to avoid developing policy responses based primarily on common perceptions of impact. And that goes back to what I said earlier about perceptions versus actual impact. And sometimes it's hard to tell. You might look around and you might see that all your neighbors are selling out and forestry is coming in. Um, and that may just be your small region of Scotland or it may be a larger trend. So um, kind of more, I mean, I'm gonna always advocate for more research because that keeps me in a job, but it really is just a note to um, dig deep when making changes in policy. And uh, there's our, uh, I cut this straight from a report, so you can tell I was talking to government, asking them to support long-term action-based social science, et cetera, et cetera, to monitor and evaluate the impacts of land use change. Um, hopefully, you know, reducing people, not only having negative impacts, but um, chasing changes, and then four years later, chasing another change and that sort of thing. Land use change just can't happen that quickly. You need to be fairly certain about it. All right, well, that is the end of my show. I thought I had an ending slide, but it looks like I don't. <laughs>
<laughs> I was going to thank all of the people who worked with me on my project, uh, particularly Annie Mickey, who has been my co-author for so many things and is an expert on Scottish land reform. So, thanks. Thanks so much, Naomi. That was such an interesting presentation.